with me. Friends out there, I say it's a privilege to be here this morning. Such an introduction as that, why well, I'm... I don't know how I'm ever going to live after that one. <laughs> but just sitting here talking, Brother Noel and I, I don't believe I've ever met a person just exactly... Uh, we all are made in different molds but by the same God, like Brother Jack Moore. <laughs> He's certainly been... Uh, Brother Noel just saying since I've been here with him as his son-in-law, and how he'd um, learned to love him and respect his wisdom and things, and that's... I can say amen to that. The many fine th- times that we've had together. He and I, Brother Brown, Brother Bootlayer here. Fine man of God. That I really love them with all my heart. And then I, I see we're all not getting any younger. Well, I just think of the time now that watching this as we change since about 20 years ago, crossing the deserts and so forth together as younger man. But just knowing that there is a land where we'll never get old. We'll meet there again someday. Last night when I was leaving the tabernacle, a little lady laying back there on a cot. And she said, Brother Branham, years ago, I think she's been paralyzed. She said, you told me, I forget what the woman's remark was. Now, it's something like this. I hope that I don't misquote it. Said that this affliction I had would be for a purpose or something that she would have a baby in. She couldn't understand how that would be done in her in that condition. There stood a young, handsome-looking young man. He said, I'm the baby. And she had. He said, I'm the baby that she had. And so many things has happened along the road. We don't even have time here to talk it over. We will on the other side. This businessman chapter, I'm... do not belong to any organization, I guess, as you all know, but I am. Um, this is the only group that I'm connected with, or pack a fellowship card, is their interdenomination. It's a businessman. They have been a great asset to me into the type of ministry that the Lord, our Father, has given me. It, um, it wasn't exactly that I'd. Uh, don't like the organization. It's just the ministry that's given to me. And if I am not loyal to that call, then I'll be a disloyal person to God. And um, I'm thinking, just before I left Tucson, maybe many of you were there. One day I was Los Angeles speaking to the chapter. And there was, uh, I had just raked the uh, organization maybe a, a little a little hard. Uh, I didn't mean to be that way. If you mean that to be mean, then I'd be a hypocrite. You mustn't do that. No, that's just throw off on someone. But I talked about a tree that I saw in Brother Sherrod's yard that had about five different kinds of fruit on it. And I said, I've never seen a tree like that in my life. It, was a, it had grapefruit. It had lemon. It had tangerine, tangelo, oranges. Everything grown on the same tree. Well, I said, I sure don't get that. What kind of a tree is it? There's an orange tree. And I said, well, that grapefruit said, yeah. I, I said, how is that? So that's grafted. And I said, oh, I see. He said, they're all of the citrus family. And any tree that's of a citrus family, think it can be grafted. I said, I understand. And I started shouting just a little bit, you know, because I am nervous and emotionally. So he said, uh, uh What's the matter? And I said, well, I was just thinking of something. And I said, now, I want to ask you a question. I said, now, next year, when the blooms come on, they won't be oranges, tangelos, grapefruits, lemons. They'll all be oranges because it's in an orange tree, Lauren. He said, no, no. No, each branch bears a own. I see. <laughs> so that still will sound real good because I'm, you know, I'm, of course, I've got a degree out of Hartford and all these other universities. <laughs> so I'm... Watch Nature. That's the best university that I've ever found yet. The Creators University. So if I watch that, I get my sermons from the way I see nature acting. I said, well, that just makes me feel real good. He said, what's the matter? I said, I just thought of something. So that day I was preaching on that. I said, now, you see, when 
The church first started out. It was Jesus said, as preached in John 15, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And every branch that don't bring forth fruit will be cut off, burnt. And somebody just straddled my neck real hard on that said, you see, I thought it was actually once filled with the Holy Ghost and saved, you said he couldn't get away from it. That's right. He said, what about that? I said, now you're talking on a different subject. He's talking about fruit bearing there, not the vine. He's talking about fruit bearing and not the life. He said, well, uh, he's cut the tree back so it will grow, bear fruit. He said, uh, I said, now see, this tree, when it started out, was all genuine Bible Christians. Then along come a branch called Luther, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, lemon, what more. And I said, you see, it thrives on the name of Christianity, but it, it's living off of that tree, but it's bearing its own denominational kind. But I said, if that orange tree ever puts out another limb itself, it'll bear oranges like it did at the beginning. There had to have been setting up there ahead of a great, one of our greatest Pentecostal organizations. I don't know how to make it so that everybody will understand that it isn't my idea that, that I'm, I'm against those brethren, sisters. That is wrong. I'm so misunderstood and I don't know why. People think I don't even believe in people going to church. That's a million miles from the truth. We must assemble ourselves together. That much more as you see the day approaching. We must come together in unity. We might not... If I lived in a city and they had nothing there but a... Uh, well, some church, uh, I don't want to call any name, but just any church that only believed one thing, that Jesus was divine, all the rest of it was wrong, I'd go to that church. If I can't get a whole loaf of bread, I'll, I'll take a slide. See? I'll go listen, worship the Lord, and show him that I'm doing my part. I want him to know I'm alive. I'm, I'm, I want everybody to know what side I'm on. I assemble with the Christians and their worship and, and serve the Lord. But it's so hard. I used to bother me so bad, and then I found out even our Lord was misunderstood in so many things. You say anything, it be misunderstood. I guess it just has to be that way. But those who are wise will understand it. The Bible said so. They'll catch it. So this morning, while saying this, and I said, now, they, they live off of the name of Christianity, but they bear the wrong kind of fruit. It has a denominational fruit. They said a thing, and they're living right off of it, and living off the very life. That's what I was trying to say last night. That spirit can be baptized into that spirit and still not be a Christian. See? You're living right off of the same life. It's the fruit you bear tells what you are. See? That's right. See? They can do all the signs and pray for the sick and heal the sick and open eyes and cast out devils and, and do all these things, living right off the same life. It's in there, but still, it's a lemon. That's right. The fruit you're knowing, Jesus said. And so then we find out, and when I got off the platform, this great leader raised up. He said, he didn't mean that. He said, we know that we're all grafted in. Well, that is true. We are grafted, stump grafted, that's right, but not in the vine grafted. So then he said, um, begin to kind of, kind of swear me back a little bit. And there was a young fellow there, I think it's some movie stars people. His name is Danny Henry. And he was a Baptist boy. Well, he comes to the platform to put his arms around me. And uh, he said, Brother Branham, I hope this don't sound sacrilegious, but I believe that could almost be the 23rd chapter of Revelation. And I said, thank you. And he started to say something else and he started speaking in tongues. A Baptist boy. And when he did, there was a, a woman from here in Louisiana. She was a Frenchman. Kind of a big, heavy-set woman. She wrote down the interpretation. Well, then there's another young fellow saying over here was a Frenchman. He wrote down what he said. They compared the notes and they both was the same. And then a Big, light-headed boy standing way back in the back of Clifton's cafeteria, come walking forth. He said, let me see those notes. I want to see what there was. And all three of them was the same for the interpretation. He was the interpreter for the UN, French interpreter. 
and said this, Because thou hast chosen this straight and narrow way, the harder way, you've done it at your own choosing. But what a glorious decision you've made, because it's my way. Thing. And said, and um, went ahead and said, then this in itself is that which will bring to pass and make and bring shall pass the tremendous victory in the love divine. You see, always even in French, the verb before the adverb there, and and uh, the interpretation. So in that, I couldn't say Moses. He made his choice. He had to make his choice. We all have to make our choices. And do the best that we can. And God, I uh, respect any man's message that he's given about God. I, whatever it is, I respect that with all my heart. Now, I see some young brother come a while ago, Brother Stringer, I think, from down in Louisiana, or Mississippi, uh, brought us some pictures here. That you see us watching it. It was of the angel of the Lord. When it appeared, how many's heard the story? I guess every one of you here has heard it. You've had it on tape and uh, so forth. Now that was told me one morning at ten o'clock, standing in my room in Indiana, told me I would be at Tucson, be early in the morning. I'd be picking a cucklebird, what we call there, a goat header, off of my trouser leg. And seven angels came and bursted just the ground, bursted and everything else. To uh, the rocks rolled out of the mountains, and seven angels stood there. And I said, well, I told my wife, which is somewhere for present this morning, you get everything ready, because no one, man could exist that. I said, come out of that. I'm going to Tucson. My work is finished here on earth. I'm going home to be with the Lord Jesus. Well, she said, are you sure? I said, yes. Yeah. No one could, could stand that. There's no way of doing it. I just preached the seven church ages. That's where I called our gallant little brother Jack Moore to ask him about this Jesus in Revelations 1 standing there with white hair and everything. I said he was a young man. And uh, that's where the revelation comes about that being a wig on and not him. His wig. And I couldn't understand it as being supreme deity. The old judges used to in Israel had to be white-headed. And uh, the white stands for purity. And the English judges to this day and Supreme Courts of England put on a white wig when they come out because there's no other law above theirs on earth. See? And they're the Supreme Judge. And um, I remember I went there in Arizona and everything. I tried my best, uh, scared to death. I went to Phoenix meeting. And you remember I preached the sermon, Sirs, what time is it? Remember that? I said, I've seen that. I said, before it comes to pass, remember, thus saith the Lord. Something's going to happen. You probably got the tapes in your library of tape now. And there I said, you remember now the vision that never fails. Something's going to happen. Remember it. And a few days after that, I was getting nervous. And I thought, what? I just, I'm going to die. I hope it's quick so I can get over it. I don't want to linger. One morning the Lord said, go up the top of Sabina Canyon. And I was up there holding up my hands, praying. I felt something strike my hand. It was a sword. Now, you can just imagine how you feel standing there by yourself, and here's a knife in your hand about that long. I pulled it down and looked at it. It's just a knife on them. Now, I'm scared of a knife anyhow. And it had a, it had a, a metal, something like one of these knives, like a pot metal or something real sharp, narrow. had a sheath around it here where the duelers used to, to keep them cutting one another's hands. And it had a pearl in the handle here. just fit my hand exactly. I rubbed my face and looked back. Right on that same spot the other day, I saw a little white dove come down. I'll tell you about that later. And uh, I was holding that in my hand. I thought, that's strange. I, Lord, I, am I losing my mind? There's no one here. I'm miles from anybody. And here is the sword I had my hand up, and where did it come from? I thought, that's the strangest thing. Now, look here, it's a sword. See, it is It's a sword. And I said, there's nobody here standing here. I'm up on top of these rocks. I'm on top of the mountain. And you couldn't even see Tucson from there. It's so far down. I thought, now, that's a strange thing. Now, it's got to be in this vicinity somewhere, somebody that could create and make a sword and put it in my hand. I said, it could only be the very God that created a ram... Where Abraham, 
to create those squirrels that you've heard. Now, so here is the material, three different kinds of material in it, and I'm holding it in my hand just as real as anything else I could hold in my hand. And I heard a voice said, that's the king's sword. And I thought, now, where did that come from? Right along there in them rocks somewhere. And I held it in my hand like that. I said, a king's sword. And I looked around, and the sword was gone. And I said, a king's sword. That to uh, they knight with the, the sword. I think that's right. The army or some way they knight with it. You know, and I said, well, that's what that was probably for. It means that maybe I'm to lay hands upon ministers or something like that to make them ministers. And then uh, a voice spoke back in and said, the king's sword, not a king, the king's sword. I thought, now I'm either beside myself, my mind is flipped. Or there's something taking place, there's somebody standing around here by me. And brethren, these things are true. I don't, I don't know how to tell you. You've always seen it always happen that way. And it's a, I couldn't understand it. So it's the strangest feeling. And I stood there and I thought, now, ever who that is that's talked to me all my life since a little bitty baby boy. Just standing right here and I can't see him at all. I said, the king's sword... That would be God is the king. And what is the sword? The word. It's been placed in your hand. So don't fear of death. It's your ministry. Oh my. Down off that mountain, I went crying, screaming at the top of my voice, jumping over rocks. I went down and told my wife, I said, I'm not going to die. It's, it's, it's my ministry. I told her to get with Billy Paul here and take the children. I said, I don't have anything, but... The church will see that you all don't go hungry and things, and I'll, I'll meet you across the bar. And, uh, and so I said, no, I'm not going to die. It's something about my ministry. A few days after that, I come out from a meeting, had a three-page telegram from over here at Houston, Texas. And that man had criticized me so bad the night that the angel of the Lord was taken, the picture of it taken there at Houston. He called me up and said, and sent a telegram. The wife said, I know, Brother Bram, you're busy. My son, Ted Kipperman, sister's boy is sitting in the death row to die in the chair. He said, what if that was Billy Paul? He said, he and a little girl's got to die. And you all read it in the paper, of course. And said, the only hope we have is for you to come hold a meeting and get the people together. And Raymond Huckstra had already wrote me several times. But you know, I planned at that meeting go on a hunting trip with Mr. McAnally and him. I thought, well, if I let them kids die and don't put my effort forth, I'll never be able to go hunting again. So I said, all right, I'll come. I'll come over to Houston, had the meeting, and of course the, they never killed him. They just they give him life. And that's what they wanted him to do, just give him life. So that's about 21 years, I guess, in, in Texas. So then, going back, I went up in the mountains, and um, I went with Brother Fred Softman. He's here somewhere. Brother Fred, where are you at? Right here. Brother Fred Softman, Brother Gene Norman. One day, the second day sitting there, the angel of the Lord came right down into the camp where we was at and began to tell about their children and things they were doing. I left and went back on the hill and I'd already got my javelina. I was trying to chase one around to Brother Fred. So I found where they'd been eating on the side of the hill and I said, well, now I'll tell you what I'll do with Brother Fred. I said, now you go over on that point in the morning. We go for a daylight, climb up over the mountain. And go there at daylight. I'll get over on the other side. Now, I won't shoot one, but if they run this way, I'll shoot in front of them and turn them back. You pick out a big one. All right, he said. So Brother Fred went over there. And Brother Gene Norman. I don't think Brother Gene come, did he? Uh, uh, he, was, he was on the other side. Many of you know Gene Norman, a bosom friend of many. Fine brother. And he went down a little below. Or the um, pigs, they just wasn't there that morning. I could see Brother Fred wave at him. He was about a mile away from me. Well, I thought, where could they have went? I went down into a great ravine and come down. I thought, I'll see if I can find where they're at. Started back up just a little after daylight. The sun was just again coming up. I went around a great big chasm or all oh, my hundreds and hundreds of feet, this great drops in that great uh, canyon there, the big walls. And it's kind of getting, the sun was raising up about seven o'clock, I guess, or something like that. And I sat down. And I was looking around. I had to look down on my trouser looking. And there was that 
bullheaded. Burr. And I said, you know that same strange? You know the angel of the Lord told me? I'd be about 40 miles northeast of Tucson. I'd be picking a bullheader off of my leg. Remember it? And I said, that's strange. I was holding it. And just as I looked up, I seen about 20 hogs, about 500 yards from me, come out, eating this little fillery and laid down. I said, now, if I can just get Brother Fred and get him around to that point there, we get his hog right there. But I know he's about a mile or two from me now. So I said, if I could cross over this little ridge without them seeing me up by this little juniper tree there. I said, if I get around this side, there's a deer trail comes down this side. I can run up there and get out of the way and hang a little piece of paper here where I know which one of the fingers to go out on, on the canyon, and get Brother Fred there just in time. I pulled this little bull hair down, forgetting about that, and started across the hill real easy and looked back. They didn't see me. Run down, hit this deer trail. And I had a great big black hat on. I started running up to this canyon real fast, and it happened. The whole earth shook everywhere. Rocks that size rolled down, dust flying like that. And I looked and stand before me, stood seven angels. This is exactly what it was. I felt like I could stand way up off the ground. First, I thought somebody had shot me. You know, that black hat on looked like a javelina hog. Anyhow, you know, they're dark. I thought somebody had shot me such a right close. And I, I seen then what it was. Well, as soon as I got my commission and the scripture... The seven seals, which is the seven mysteries. See, someone said to me, said, now I always said, well, now someday the Lord, probably you seeing visions, Brother Bram, will reveal to you what these things are. We can all get closer to God and have more power than we get in speaking in tongues and things. I said, it can't be that way. Because, see, I believe the word to be the truth. And the Bible said, whosoever shall add one word or take one word from it. It has to be in this word. See, it's the mysteries that the people's overlooked. Well, right there is where comes my message of serpent seed and the true belief of the security of the believer. I'm not disgrading my Presbyterian brethren there and some of you Baptist brethren on the way you have security. I'm not saying this to be different, but you didn't have it just right. But I had it wrong too. But when an angel stands from heaven and tells you, and here it is right in the Scripture, uh, that's true. That's right. See, it always speaks exactly with the Scripture. In there, I watched it until that circle went up, started sweeping up, and it turned into like a mystic light, like a fog. Just exactly the way, how many seen the picture of it to take to Houston? Well, that's just the way this was. It turned into the same thing. It kept going higher and higher. I was running and running, trying to find Brother Fred and them. After a while, about half an hour later, I could see him way down waving his hands and Brother Gene coming waving. They know something had happened. And so, then I got with him. That's Brother Fred sitting right there. As it went up, I didn't know that the observatories and things coming to Mexico was taking that picture. Life magazine packed it as it went up. And many of you, here's Life magazine packing the picture of it. A mysterious thing here. They said they don't know where it comes from. It's too high above all the spheres and everything else to be. It's too high for falls. Because it's 30 miles high and 27 miles across after you got up that high. There's not even humidity or nothing up there, see. And they thought of a plane, so they checked all the places. No planes up that day. See, they have to, they're all kind of shaking windows and things. There's no planes up. Here it is right here in the magazine to tell you the same thing. And, uh, and it went on and on. And today, right in the, here it is in Science Magazine, where they can't understand. They don't know what it is. Tucson. At the university, a friend of mine went over the other day and was talking to him about said, we can't understand what... I said, don't say nothing. Don't do no good. Cast not your pearls before swine. See? It's to the church, to the elected, they called out. See? And then each one was come and said, Brother Bram, I see your picture here. I see this. I, you know how it is. But that, that long sweep that this brother has on here where... Here's the way it started up, sweeping up. Actually, this is on the right-hand side, and you all remember I said the noted angel was the one that talked to me. It was on the right-hand side, even before it happened, you remember? His wings pointed back like that. That's exactly the wings of that angel as it went up. So they started taking the pictures because it was so mysterious. But when the last picture, when it formed itself into the skies and so forth, this is it. As, uh, look here, packages. You see how it's... Goes up just as they begin to see it, you see. And there comes the, the real main and last picture when it formed. They don't know where it come from or where it went. 
They don't know yet science is completely stumped by it. They don't know what happened. But we know. There shall be signs in the heaven above. And he promised these things. See? And the only thing that this was permitted to be taken... Now, I know we're just home folks here this morning. If I ever impress you, brethren or sisters, as a know-it-all, please forgive me. I don't mean to be that. I'm sat- sitting here this morning talking before men who are scholars, men who are smart. Uh, I, I'm uh, uh, illiterate. I can't even pronounce my scriptures right. I got a chapter to read this morning. I was going to ask one of the brothers here to read it for me because I can't even pronounce the names in it. First Chronicles 13. If you will, Brother Jack, and be hunting up for my subject. I, I can't even pronounce those names. I'm letting him do it because he can pronounce them. And I know I'm talking to smart men. But, brethren, these things are done that you might not look at my literacy, but believe it, I'm telling you the truth, that God tells me the truth. It's the truth. Now, and when I speak of denomination, I'm not meaning for you to be so cruel. And, no, I don't mean for you not to go to your church. Go to your church. It's what you're supposed to do. But just don't join up with them organizations. Because one day, I'll be telling you, and prove it by the Scripture, it is the mark of the beast. And you just remember, it's the mark. I'm preaching. I wouldn't preach it in Brother Jack's church. He'd tell me, go ahead and do it. But I'm going to the tabernacle. It'll be about four hours long. Uh, my subject is the beast at the beginning and the beast at the end through the trail of a serpent. And it takes about four hours. I got my Scriptures all laying out. The beast from the beginning, he was the beast at the Garden of Eden, he's the beast at the end, and show that he's a religious person and a denomination that made the denomination and come right through the trail of it and prove it to you by the scriptures that it is. I didn't know that till the Holy Spirit gave it to me the other day up there. Now, in this, I was watching this one day, standing, and something said to me, looking at it, I thought, Brother Hickerson, one of my trustees or deacons at the church in Jeffersonville, well, I don't believe in going to church, why do I have church? We had them all across the country, hooked up the other night. Not every 200 square miles had one of my churches. Now, this, this picture I was standing looking at, and something uh, standing in my room, something said, turn it to the right. Uh, listen, I know that sounds like somebody's a little mentally upset. But you see, as I said the other night, all these great things are so scholarly. Now, I'm not against that. Remember. We have to I'll send your children to school and get education and so forth. But I'll tell you right now, it won't do them no good in the world that is to come. Because there'll be another civilization already so far above this. That civilization won't even have any, it won't have any schools in it. It won't have any death in it. There won't be any sin in it. This has all of that. No matter how much civilized we get, more and more death is added all the time. That'll be without death. But now we have to have school. We have to wear clothes. We I was going to speak this morning on Satan's Eden. Many of us got the tape of it. Satan's Eden. He has made another Garden of Eden in 6,000 years. He's taken him to make it just like God did his at the beginning. God made his Eden and Satan corrupted it. Now Satan's made his own Eden and God's going to destroy it. And put his own. Something said to me, turn it right. Well, I think I'm looking at it right. He said, turn it right. Okay. I thought maybe that voice means turn it to the right. And when it did, you see what it is. Hoffman's head of Christ at 33. You look in there, see his black beard, his face, his eyes, his nose, and everything else. See the part in his hair, here comes it. And he's wigged with that white angel wig to show that the message of him being God is the truth. He is the supreme judge of the universe, supreme judge of heaven and earth. He is God and nothing else but God. He is God expressed in human form, called the Son of God, which the Son was the man. And if that don't make our message exactly right, identified by the Scripture, identified in service, identified by His presence, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, those seven seals are the truth, brethren. You might disagree with them, but just sit down and study it with your open heart one time. 
Just let the Holy Spirit lead you from Scripture. When Brother Jack, I called him before preaching this and talked to him one time about what was this white wig. He said, well, Brother Bram, I declare it to be that it was in his, after his resurrection in his glorified body. I talked to Brother Jack. And there's, I don't know of anybody in the world that I rely on any more of their uh, teachings on theology and things that I would like Brother Jack Moore, Brother Bale, and such man as, as that. Real theologian. It's read all kinds of books from different angles from everything. Well, but you see, even with that, in my bosom friends, uh, I, I just couldn't receive it. There was something there that just wouldn't take it. Then when it comes this, then I see what it is. Here's his dark beard. You've seen it again. His dark beard, dark hair, his eyes, nose, everything, just perfectly. And even the part is there, coming over on this side. He is God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, this is Look Magazine, or Life Magazine. I think this is the, um, uh, I forget what issue it is now. Oh, May the 17th, 1963. That's when it come out. If anybody wants the magazine, it's the same picture. It's got Rocky Fella and his, his wife on the back of it. And this is the new science magazine that it's still a mystery. What did I say these things for? That it might give you a little view of the things that we're trying to say that God is identifying both in heavens and in earth. To be right. These discernments, visions, we have plenty of impersonations. We always, but remember, before there could be a bogus dollar, there has to be a real dollar first. First has to be a real dollar. And then they're made off of that. Just like we had a real Moses and a real Aaron. Then we had a Jambres and Jambres. After them. You see how it all comes? They see it, and then they try to impersonate that one is truly one original. That's right. Not saying that to harm or to degrade or misplace something, but just for truth to know that I'm getting to be an old man. And I know my time ain't too long. If Jesus tarries, I, I could stay a little while. But I know that someday... This heart's going to make its last beat. And I'm entering into a great dark chamber there called death. But when that comes, I don't want anything to have to look back for or try to repent for. I want when I come to that time to be clean and pure by the grace of God. I want to wrap myself in the robes of His righteousness when I enter there. With this one thing in my mind, I know Him in the power of His resurrection. And when he calls, I'll come out from among the dead and live with him forever. And it's my purpose here now to try to get every man, not to change your theologies or nothing, but to increase your faith in God's promise of this day. Now let us pray. Dear God, we are a grateful people this morning, but yet, Lord, we're living in a dark world that's there isn't a one of us here this morning, Father, but what feels that we, we want a closer walk with you. We want that, that touch of you in our lives that can tender us, make us uh, flexible so that you can change us at any time, mold us into sons and daughters of God. That, that's our purpose here, Father. That, that's my only... Uh, objective that I have is to try to uh, to live before you and to get your word and speak it back to the man and women that not to be a different person but to try to honor him who has given me life. Granted, Lord, may there not be a person here today or, or if, if we're hooked up this morning across the nation again May there not be a person that, in the sound of her voice, ever have to go into that great chamber not knowing you in the power of your resurrection. There be sinners somewhere across the country that are in this building, this great auditorium sitting here this morning. If there are those who don't know you, may this be the day that their conscience will be shook, woke up. 
and they'll realize that they don't know what minute that we may be called or summoned to answer for our lives on high. And if our name is still on that stop book, doom we'll be. But if it's in the Lamb's book of life, real life, then we are saved. And may, Lord, as that life travels from the blade into the pollen, into the shuck, then to the grain, while we're passing through this morning, if there be some life that goes into the grain that's laying back in that stalk, bring it out today, Lord. May it follow the moving of the grain. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry to take so much time. I forgot about this even being on the radio time out there or the phone time. Now, let us turn for our reading. And Brother Jack, if you got your Bible there, while I'm finding my scripture, I'll ask Brother Jack to read this scripture because I cannot pronounce these names. Uh, it's in the First Chronicles 13. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us, and let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we have we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David gathered all Israel together from Shihor of Egypt, even unto the entering of Heman, to bring the ark of God from kirjath Jerium. And David went up and all Israel to Bela, that is, to kirjath which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadad, and Uzzah, and Ahau drave the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might, and with singing, and with harps, and with psalters, and with timbrels, and with cymbals, and with trumpets. And when they came to the threshing floor of Shedon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, and because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before the Lord. And David was displeased, because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in the house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Thank you, Brother Moore, for the reading of the scripture for me. Now... Sorry I couldn't read that myself, but I, I couldn't do it. Now, I want you to turn with me to Mark 7:7, 7, 7, and we'll read the first seven verses of St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when he saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiles, that is to say, with unwashed hands they found fault. But the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands, eat off, not hold, holding the traditions of the elders. And when they came forth from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things were or they, which they have received of the received the whole the washing of the cup and a pot and brass vessels and a table. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders? 
but eat bread with unwashed hands. He answered and said unto them, Well, has Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrites? As it is written, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of man. Let us pray. Dear God, honor your word now, and may it accomplish that which it is purposed for. Use us as instruments to speak it, and our ears to hear from you, and our hearts to receive it. We ask in Jesus' name, for the glory of God, amen. Now my subject for a, a few moments is this. I, we are on the national uh, uh, telephone hook up this morning, and I understand that my good friend Roy Border is listening in pretty well tore up about last night. I forgot that we were on the radio or this hook up last night. Roy, wherever you are, if you're over in San Jose in the church there, or either down to Brother McHugh's church or wherever you are, don't fear, my brother. Everything will be all right. Sit still. You just, he'll make it known to me, Roy. Don't weary, son. Have faith in God. My subject this morning is trying to do God a service without it being God's will. Now, that's a strange text. And I trust that the Lord will reveal this to us now. Remember, trying to do God a service without it being the will of God. Now, that seems very strange. But in this, maybe God can help us. Another thing I'd like to say this morning, that we're glad to have in our midst a friend of mine, a very dear friend, a, a young fellow. Many of you people on the radio now, can, or the, on the telephone hookup, knows who this is. Today is his birthday, 93 years old. Brother Bill Dow, sitting here before me. 93 years old. Several years ago, the doctor said he cannot live. I just noticed him sitting here now. Under oxygen, and his lovely wife called me and said, Brother Bram, if you expect to see your old friend Bill alive, you better come at once. And I, one of my tires is cut on the side. My wheel had been knocked out, and I tore a tire off my car trying to get to him. I was just coming from a, a, a station, filling station, and uh, coming from the restroom where I stopped in Ohio trying to get to him. And walking out, I saw a vision. And there stood Brother Dow standing in the church with his hand out. And it changed, and I see him coming down the street and shook my hand. said, Go tell him, Thus saith the Lord. He was about 90 years old then. He had a heart attack with a heart block and a complete heart failure. Very shrewd doctor. The man is uh, not... Uh, you don't want, I know I won't say that. He's just a man that can afford to get any doctor he wants. He had a very fine Jewish doctor who met me in the hall and said, there's not a chance for him to live. Now I went in and slipped my hand under the oxygen tent. I said, Bill, can you hear me? He nod his head. I said, thus saith the Lord. You're not going to die. A week from then, when I got in the pulpit to preach my message, here come Brother Dow walking up to the building. And when I went over to Fur's restaurant, I mean the Blue Boar, across in Louisville, here he's getting out of the car, coming down the street, <laughs> holding his hand out. Just exactly according to the word of the Lord. That's three or four years ago, and here he sits all the way down here in Shreveport, crosses the nation, not by plane now, by car, sitting here this morning. Happy birthday, Brother Dow. That's from all across the nation, from everywhere. God bless you. I baptized him after being a Trinitarian. I baptized him when he was on my first meeting, when Brother Banks Woods had to let him have his clothes. He's a good-sized man, as you see. 
And he went into the pool and I baptized him at about 85 or 90 years old in the name of the Lord Jesus. He said he never could feel right until he found that security of something. Then he received a birthday where he'll never grow old. <laughs> That's right, that great land. He even is expecting to live to see the coming of the Lord. It can be done. But if he would sleep, he and we are awake at that time, he'll come first. <laughs> so, brother, thou, there's no way now to miss it. You're exactly on the line. Stay there, my brother. God bless you. I thank the Lord for a good man like that and for giving him all of these years. In the book of the Chronicles, trying to do God a service without it being his will. God is sovereign first. We want to understand that. The people today are wondering why we can't have a revival. You believe God's sovereign? See, the Bible speaks this way. And we try, as I was discussing with a group of my fine brothers, Baptist brethren, not long ago, and they said, Brother Branham, we can only have a revival when we take the word, word by word, page by page, letter by letter. And I said, I believe too, page by page. He said, I said, they've been trying to do that all along. He said, but we must find the Greek interpretation of the word. What the Greek says. I said, I haven't read too much, but reading the history of the church and the Nicaea Council and the pre nicaea Council and the Nicaea Father and so forth, they were arguing back there about the Greek. That's 2,000 years ago. One said it means this, one says it means that. The Greek word means this, it's like our language. The word sea, you use word sea, you can mean a body of water, I understand, or many things. Board, to be bored a hole, make a walk, or, or you bored me, or you paid my board, or it can mean any, many things. And those little vowels and so forth just change the whole meaning. So you'll never do it like that. God wrote it like that. Because the, all the word is inspired and said that I thank thee, Father, thou hast hid these things from the eyes of the wise and prudent, and will reveal. Amen. Today, such as we'll learn. It's a revelation of him, as I said last evening. We'll reveal it to thee. I said it won't work, sir. I said a revival will never come until God, the sovereign God, sends it. And then he might take up a little nitwit that can't even sign his name and do it with it. And no, it's not even good English, let alone the Greek. That's what he done in the time when Peter preached the Pentecost. You know, he couldn't even sign his name. Ignorant and unlearned. But God does things in such strange way to our intellectual thinking. That makes it God. If he'd got a bunch of of theologians and dignitaries and so forth that said, that smart Caiaphas, as you see, he had it just right. But God went out and got fishermen. They couldn't even sign their name. That's what he took. That's God. He takes something that's nothing and makes something out of it to his own honor. He took a chaos and made it Eden. God. Now, if there's anybody got the mechanics for a revival, is our noble brother Billy Graham. But the mechanics is all right, but the mechanics won't move it. It takes the dynamics to move it. You can build an automobile, put fine seats in it, make fine pistons and, and prove by science what it can do. But unless the dynamics is there, it's just a dead piece of good. So in the Welsh revival, one of our late revivals before our Pentecostal, no one knows what started the revival. Just a bunch of people. Now when we get all, our friend Billy Graham will get all the Presbyterians, Lutherans, and Pentecostals and everything together, go into the city and there they'll have a great a gathering together with thousands and 30,000 will come in two weeks and give their hearts to Christ, go back another two weeks and he ain't got a one. That's the mechanic. 
But let God in his sovereign grace just speak to some little nitwit, as they would say, a little nobody. Let his spirit fall into the city and man can't go to work. Women can't wash dishes. The maids can't make the beds. They're screaming and crying with their hands up in the air. That's revival. That's in the will of God. It was said that some nobleman from the church went over to the Wales to understand or figure out what all the mechanics was in the revival and doing the Welsh revival. And when they got off the ship with their tall hats on and their round collars, see come down the street a little policeman swinging his club around and around like that, whistling. They said, my good man, could you tell me where the Welsh revival is? He said, yes, my brother, and you're standing in the middle of it. <laughs> he said, you understand, I am the Welsh revival. Said because the Welsh revival is in me. <laughs> That's sovereign. That's what God does. And he alone has the right to send a revival. That gets the mechanics together is pray for God to send the dynamic. He only reveals his word in the predestinated. Now, when I use the word predestinate, now, it's a bad word to use in public, especially when we have mixed crowds between the Armenians and the uh, Calvinists. And not a, I've asked you not to think of know it all, but they're both wrong, according to the Scripture. Grace is what God did for me, works is what I do for him. See? Then you've got it. If you climb out on either one of the limbs, you'll sure find yourself out on the end of the limb and can't get back. The book of Ephesians pulls it together, I think. Now... But the word when I use it, predestinate, don't think that I'm, that's the only word I know how to, uh, to make. It's God's foreknowledge, see, that he know he, he can't say he, he died that all might be saved. He did, but by his foreknowledge, he knows who would and who would not. See, that's what he knows. I don't know it. You don't know it. So we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, but God has his word set and has in all ages his foreknowledge has caused him to set in the church and in the people certain things that he did from the beginning. And then the gospel that's being preached of that age is only revealed to that certain people. The rest of them don't see it. See? Thank thee, Father, thou hast hid these things from the eyes of the wise and freedom. And reveal it to babes such as would learn. That's predestination. Not that he did it by saying, I'll choose you and don't choose you. By his foreknowledge, you know what you would do. By him being infinite, you believe he's infinite? If he isn't, he can't be God. Then you think, being infinite, he knew every flea that would ever be on the earth. How many times them fleas would bat their eyes? How much tallow was in each flea? Every blade of grass it would ever set on. That's infinite. And we're finite. We stumble in darkness. God likened us to sheep and we must have a leader. And that leader is not man. That leader is the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of Christ among us. A little while and the world seeth me no more. His physical being was raised up to the throne of God. Where the Spirit was on the throne, now Christ is on the throne. Jesus. A little while in the world sees me anymore, yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you to the end of the world. Even in you, the throne of God, of Christ, is erected into your heart. And he's sitting on God's throne, but in the millennium he sits on his own throne, which he swore that he'd raise up this man, his son, to, David's son, to sit on his throne. Now, he reveals these things by his foreknowledge to those who he has ordained to these things. Otherwise, they don't see it. Stand right there looking right at it and can't see it. How many have ever seen that picture of a cow in a bush that you just have to look and look? Have you ever seen that or seen a picture of Christ in a bush or in the sky or clouds? 
See, that painter has got that so fixed up, so you have to look at it just a certain way. Well, then, when you once see it, you can't see nothing else but that. Every time you look there, how many have seen those pictures? I'm sure you have. Well, that's the way Christ is himself. The gospel, the message is. When you want to see the message of the hour, there's nothing else you can see but there. That's all. Everything else is gone. The rest of it's just a filler. See? When you want to see the message, that was Noah's time. When Noah and his group killed, when they saw the message, nothing else mattered. When Moses' group saw it, nothing else mattered. When John's group saw it, nothing else mattered. When Jesus' group saw it, nothing else mattered. When the apostles' group saw it, nothing else mattered. When Luther's group saw it, Wesley's group saw it, Pentecostal group saw it, nothing else mattered. They pulled away from everything. Why? By his foreknowledge. He predestinated these things to happen. He chooses his own person by his foreknowledge. Like he said in Romans 8 here, that Esau at the at the uh, election of God might stand sure that Esau and Jacob, both born of holy parents, twins, that his election might stand sure and true. He said, I hate Esau and love Jacob before either boy was born. He knows what's in man. He knows it from the beginning what it was. Therefore, he can make everything work just exactly on clock time. We get all nervous and frustrated you never seen him flustrated. They don't, see? Everything's working all right. Just exactly the clock's ticking. These things are supposed to happen. All these women with short hair and these men wearing their, like, they got hair like their wives. I see them absolutely have these roller curlers in their hair, curl it up here in front. What a perversion. That's the result of Satan's Eden. And like her, she's trying to cut her hair like her husband. Her husband's letting his hair grow like his wife. And she is wearing his clothes, and he's wearing her underneath clothes. There you are. She's getting masculine, and he's getting feminine. See? It's Satan's Eden, contrary to what God made it at the beginning. That's the truth. If I don't get started, we'll never get into this. But these things, and the way for him to do it, and who will do it, that's his own chosen way. He chooses. That's the way he wants it done. As I heard Brother Perry Green, our pastor of Tucson, preaching the other night about how that God made things some way, I forget what his text was, but he said, that's the way God likes it. That's the way God does it. Well, that's right. Now, who is it among us that's going to tell him he's wrong? Who would dare to stand up in God's face and say, You're wrong, Lord. You should do it the way I want it done. The way Dr. So-and-so said it should be done. Who is that far gone in their mental faculties to say a thing like that? No, you wouldn't come out and say it, but you think it. Like on my message of the Antichrist. There shall rise false Christ. Now, I didn't say false Jesus. See, nobody would stand still to be called Jesus in the term of the Lord. But false Christ means the anointed. Oh, they, each one thinks he's got anointing. Glory to God, he can do this and do that. But put him on the word test and find where he comes out at the, of the message of the hour. They had anointing in the time of Jesus, but not on him. They had anointing in time, even Dathan had anointing in the time of Moses. He said, now, don't you think you're the only holy one among us? God's got plenty. We'll just start an organization here, a group of men. God said to Moses, separate yourself from him. And he opened up the earth and swallowed them up. He had given his original word to Moses, his prophet. That's the only way he ever did do it and the only way he ever will do it. He doesn't change his plan. So our ideas is wrong. His ideas are right. Always. And don't try to tell him that he's wrong. No matter who we think is best qualified, it isn't us to say who's best qualified. Now, that's where you get in the organization. 
Some little brother filled with the Spirit will go into a city and build up an organism, uh, build up a, a nice group of people, and at the conference they'll meet and all the holy brethren get along, you know, and say, you know what? I believe little Jones here, he's just a little pick among them. I think he ought to have that nice big tabernacle, I think. Don't you think that's right? No, my, there he goes. And then the congregation scattered. See? Separate these. God does the separating. He's the one who does it. But they all, each one wants to take this little one and put him over here and this one down here. That's man's idea. Man has the keys, but God holds the keys, actually. They give the disciples, the holy church, the keys. And watch for the first time they used it. When Judas had fell by transgression, they got together and cast lots. And the holy brethren, who would say they wasn't a holy brethren? Who would say they wasn't holy? But they cast lots and it fell on the penis and went what did he ever do? Nothing. But Paul was the elected one. Amen. That was God's choosing. A little hook-nosed, sarcastic, hot-tempered Jew. Not the Messenius, the D.D., you know, he, he was... It's Paul. God chose Paul. The church chose, chose Messenius. You have no right to tell God he's wrong. He knows what to do. He knows what man's made out of. Who would ever, that church ever chose Paul? Oh, no. Never. It said that guy's the one putting us all in jail. But God said, I'll show him what he'll suffer for me. You know, huh? All right, no matter who we think is right, God knows who's best qualified because he knows the heart of man. He knows. Nor does the revival or does these things happen at the time that we think they ought to happen. We think it's just time right now, glory to God, I notice in our chapters and so forth of the business, man, there's coming right away, hallelujah, a great revival. Don't be deceived. He has already come and they did to him what was left. But they think there's a revival. Is it happening? No. It's done. It's dead. It's over. Notice, this is lamp trimming time, coming out and going in. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Notice here in our text, notice David, king of Israel, he was the one who got the revelation of bringing the ark of God back to his place that they never consulted it in the days of Saul. Because Saul had backslid. So they never consulted the ark at all, the covenant, in the days of Saul, because he had backslid and got away from God. So David quickly, with inspiration, now I notice this, it's a very treacherous text if you don't get it right. And I feel that the hour is coming where we should be man instead of baby. We should have strong meat instead of milk. Notice David, king of Israel. The king has just been freshly anointed the king, or elected king. Saul, Samuel anointed him by the will of God, and he was absolutely God's chosen king. No doubt to it. Here he is, the inspiration strikes him. It was revealed to David. He got the revelation. Nobody else had said nothing about it. Let us go and fetch the ark, because that's the will of God. That we have the ark here with us, that we can stop God by this ark. Very, very gallant thing, don't you think so? All right. Remember, but him being king and got the revelation, he overstepped his place. There was a prophet in the land by the name of Nathan. He was the one that was ordained to get the revelation. If there's anything to be spoke. He said, the Lord doeth nothing until he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. But you see, David being king, with the anointing up on him. Now, is that the scripture? Anointing up on him and got a true revelation. But it was wrong. Because Nathan was a prophet of that age. And the revelation never come to Nathan. And when the revelation come to David... He never even consulted Nathan about it. 
He's just going to go ahead and do what he wanted to do. But notice who David consulted here in the 13th chapter. But he consulted the captains of thousands and of hundreds back to his congregation. Now, don't you think we should... That isn't it. Now, he was trying to do God a service, but he wasn't ordained to do it. Because God had a way. Just the same as God could have spoke to the... Uh, the uh, king about his sword is getting well, but he didn't. He had an ordained way of doing it. That was his prophet. So he spoke to the prophet. Isaiah told him to go back and tell Hezekiah what would happen. Now, he, Hezekiah was talking face to face with God, and, and God could talk to Hezekiah, of course, but he made certain channels. You understand it? God has his own set way of doing things. Sending revivals, talking, speaking, whatever it is, he has his way of doing it, and we are nobody to tell him how to do it. He does it the way it pleases him to do it. So you see David being inspired. Now, you remember I said the anointing, the false anointing? Remember the Holy Spirit can come and anoint a person and still it's out of the will of God. Here it proves it right here. We have to go through God's way of doing it. Not our ways, God's way of doing it. Because David, being a king, anointed. Anointed with the Spirit of God upon him. A type of Jesus Christ. But that wasn't God's channel. And all the congregation, it pleased them, the Bible says. Notice, captains of thousands and of hundreds. Also the priests and theologians. Oh, that was wonderful. There is your Bible schools and everything else. They thought it was wonderful. Even all the people agreed, and the priests and, and all of them agreed that the king's anointing was right. Notice, but God had not promised to reveal his word in its seasons to them. God had his way of revealing his word, but not to them. Remember, it was contrary to God. Something like in the days of Micah, the son of Imlin. Do you remember that story? Judah and Israel were separated. And they had two different kingdoms. And Ahab was a king over one kingdom, and Jehoshaphat was over the King, kingdom of Judah, I believe it was. And Ahab was over Israel. Jerusalem. Notice. And then, here come in a bunch of aliens and took off part of the God-given land that God had given to Israel. And these Philistines up there, or Syrians, were holding that ground and were feeding their own children off of the ground that belonged to Israel. And so they needed that ground to feed their own children and their own families. God gave them, that was their God-given right. And so Ahab called down Jehoshaphat and said, come down. He said, look at there what our enemy's doing. Is it right that we, the people of God, with a God-given right that we should have this land? It belongs to us. God, through his prophet Joshua, divided this land. It should be ours. It belongs to us, to our children. And here, the communist has tucked it over. And we have, we're hungry. And they've got our God-given rights. Don't you think that we should go up there and take our land back? If you join your forces, if you Methodists and Presbyterians all, and Presbyterians and Lutheran and so forth all take the ecumenical council here now, we'll all sit together and we'll take the thing. I'm saying and speaking in a parable now. We'll go get it. Why, well, I said, certainly we're all one. Now, the Bible said, how can two walk together except they be agreed? There were that great man, that great Pentecostal man, <laughs> Jehoshaphat, got mixed up with the wrong crowd. And that's what's happened to our Pentecostals today. 
There's some real men in there, but they're mixed up in that denominational crowd. Get out of that thing! It's cursed of the Lord. Notice now. There he was. And he said, yes, that sounds reasonable. He said, our church is yours, our people. After all, we're all Jews. Sure, we'll go up with you. But is this enough religion left in Jehoshaphat to say, don't you think we should consult the Lord first? I think it'd be a good idea. Why, well, Ahab, of course, said, well, sure, I should have thought of that. Well, is there a man of God somewhere? Have you got a prophet? Oh, I got 400 of them. I got the whole council down here, the whole denomination. They're Hebrew prophets. I remember the Bible said they were prophets. Hebrew prophets, not heathen prophets, Hebrew prophets. A school of them, a theological seminary. Well, bring them up. And the kings dressed themselves and sat before them to impress the prophets. And here come, I believe, it's Zedekiah come up, the great chief of the district councilman or whoever what he was. Come up there among them. He made himself two big horns. He said, I have heard from God. Thus saith the Lord. With these horns you'll push the Syrian out of land. Oh, glory. Everybody thought that was wonderful. Fine. Watch how close it gets to that razor aid now. Between right and wrong. Remember, it'll fall on one of the other sides. And it comes down sometimes like a honed razor. Between the difference of right and wrong. It's got to be every word of God. Not just almost every word, but every word. And it's got down today, not to Lutheran, not to Methodist, not to Pentecostals, but to that honed age. In this age where this, the Antichrist anointing is so perfectly, it would deceive the very elected, they'll fall on the wrong side if they don't want it. Like a wedge. Watch. Be careful. We're not living in a Pentecostal age now. We're past that age, just the same as we've passed Luther. And past... Notice. Now, the prophets all prophesied, 400 of them, well fed, well fixed. Hebrew prophets gave them witness, one accord, thus saith the Lord. Go up! The Lord is with you! Jehoshaphat said, well, that, that sounds all right, but said, have you got another one? Another one? We got the whole denomination here. We got the whole council gathered out here. Why do we need another one? He said, oh... But I thought maybe there might be another one. He said, oh, yes, there is another one. But he don't even belong to this council. He's an outcast. It's Micah, the son of England, and I hate him. But they won't receive him in the fellowship. And he's just a common outcast to begin with. And he's constantly, everything he prophesies, he just won't encourage my seminary a bit. And he does all these things evil. He's always prophesying evil against me. Just to be different. <laughs> oh, Jehoshaphat said, don't let the king say such a thing as that. But I'd like to hear what this man's got to say. He said, well, we'll find him. So they sent out some word in the wilderness, and they sent a man and said, told him, said, now, on your road back. Now, I want to tell you something. Uh, do you want to get back in the denomination again? Do you want to have fellowship with all of them again? If you do, say the same thing the district presbyter said. Say the same thing the bishop said. And they'll bring you right back. Now it's the time to do it. But could you imagine an anointed true prophet of God compromising on one word of God? No, indeed. He said, as the Lord lives, I'll only say what God says. We need a son of England. As the Lord lives, I'll only say what he says. Right. What he said. So when they got down there before the people, all the prophets, they said, Now you say that. He said, Wait, give me tonight. Let me see what the Lord's going to say. So that night the Lord appeared to him in a vision and told him what to say. The next morning he said, What do you say? Imlin, when he's all standing out, I mean, uh, uh, Micah, son of Imlin, said, What do you say now? We're all here together, all the priests and all the prophets and all the kings and everything sitting here together. What do you say now at this great council? They go on up. Said, but I've seen Israel scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And they have said, What did I tell you? 
That renegade can only prophesy evil against me. How could he say anything else when God was saying the same thing? A prophet's supposed to be the mouth of God speaking. Not his own thinking. He, he speak, he's to him completely yielded to God. He don't want to hurt nothing, but he has to say what God says. Because he has no control of it himself. He said, now, didn't I tell you? And then up come the, the big man with the horn and smacked him in the mouth. He said, which way went the Spirit of God when it went out of me? In other words, let me try to break that down. Look here. In, uh, look here. I want to tell you something, Micah. Do you realize that I am a master in the Scripture? Do you realize that I have the anointing or the baptism we say today? Do you realize that I have that? He said, I'm not doubting that. He said, but listen. The Spirit of God has told me and bore witness with all my 400 here that we're going to push the Syrians out of the land. And who are you to come around and say that our great king is going to be slain. He said, the Spirit of God told me that. Let me just break it down so you understand it. And maybe we find Micah says, last night in the vision, sir, I saw God sitting up on a throne. And I saw all the hosts of heaven gathered around me. And they were having a council in heaven. They said, who can we get to go down and deceive Ahab? Because under the throne here is a prophet, a true prophet. His name is Elijah. And he has prophesied by my word and said that that wicked Ahab, because he slew Nabal, the dogs will lick the blood of that wicked man. And we've got to make that come to pass because it's already been spoken. It's thus saith the Lord. It has to come to pass. Got to be there. And how are we going to do it? Then down from the creeping regions of the lost. Way down in there come a spirit moving up. He said, I'm a deceiver. If I can do a service to you, I'll go down and get his prophet. Because they were so organized, they'll only understand one thing, and that's a little emotion. And I'll cause them to prophesy a lie. And I'll get Ahab to listen to those dignitaries instead of your real prophet. Because he'll examine everything he says with your word. He'll examine his visions by the word. He'll examine everything he does by the Word. If it ain't with the Word, he wouldn't listen to it. But if it's, I can deceive these others, and I'll, they, Ahab's got so much confidence in that great unity together of their safety, so they go around together, and they'll get together, and I'll cause Ahab to listen to them go out there, and that's how we'll do it. God said, you can do it. You're a real deceiver. You go on down. And then Zedekiah smacked him in the mouth. He said, where was you? He said, you'll find out when you're sitting in the inner cell. He said, go up, said Zedekiah to the king. He said, go up and return in peace. Ahab said, take that fellow and put him into the prison. Put him in shackles. Feed him bread of sorrow and water of sorrow. And when I return back with my victory from out here, which my prophets have told me at this revival was sure to happen, he said, I'll hand to that fellow... Listen to Micah's last words to that man. If you return at all, then God never spoke to me. <laughs> See, God has his way of doing things. These men thought they were doing God a service. Be careful. Not emotion, not enthusiasm, not imagination, but it must be thus saith the Lord. It must be right. All right. No matter. We find these things so. Notice. Now when David had made this great proclamation, and it seemed like that it was good, a good thing to do, then we find out 
that, uh, am I tiring you? Am I too late? Uh, this made this great proclamation. He consulted, not the prophet. Now, anyone knows that Amos 3, 7 said that God promised that he would never do nothing until first he revealed it to his prophet. Through the church ages, we've had reformers. But promised from Malachi 4 that there would be a prophet in our land in the last days because it has to fit that pattern. See, before the end time comes. Before Jesus comes the first, Elisha comes. Elisha of Malachi 3. Matthew 11 says so. If you can understand it, this is who was spoken of. Behold, I send my, uh, my messenger before me. Now he's prophesied all theologians believe that. That in the last day, the spirit of Elisha is to come too. It has to come five times. God uses that spirit. Elisha, Elijah, John the Baptist, and for the Gentile church, and then for the Jews, uh, uh, Revelation 11 chapter. That's God, G-R-A-C-E-F-A-R-T-H-J-E-S-U-S-U-S, -E -S 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 -E the letter five. Can't stop at four. You have to go to five. Notice. Now, he promised that. So that sets the Bible just exactly to this day in the Sodom and Gomorrah. And Elijah was not, that wasn't Elijah. That was the Spirit of God on Elijah. Elijah was just a man. Now, we've had Elijah's and Elijah's coats and Elijah's mantles and Elijah's everything. But the Elijah this day is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is to come, according to Matthew 7, uh, Luke 17, 30. He is the Son of Man is to reveal himself among his people. Not a man, God. But it'll come through a prophet. Now, he never had two major prophets at the same time. Never in the world. See, no matter how much these two, two heads, can't, it has to be one head. God has to get one man under his control. There's one God. There was Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but one God over it all. Notice, they just used them offices, so has he with Elijah. The spirit of Elijah, he used that spirit, but the same God controlling it all the time to fulfill his word. Now, notice in this now. David thought he had everything in order, and he was inspired. See how the Holy Spirit can anoint a man? But it's got to be in the order of the anointing. The outside spirit can be anointed with the Holy Ghost, and the soul is darkest pitch. The cockle bird grows on the same water that Bill puts life into the wheat, puts life into the cockle bird. But at the bottom of the cockle bird, it's a cockle bird life. It's rejoicing and blooming and got life and doing everything that the wheat does. But the soul of it is cockle bird. False teachers can rise, teaching all kind of Trinitarianism and everything else, and be anointed with the Holy Ghost and perform just as many miracles as the true gospel can. But by the word, that's what does. You know what I mean? Now, it's all right to teach this, I guess. I'm, I'm in an interdenominational tabernacle this morning. This hotel here. Notice. Watch what we're saying. Now, listen. David had all the emotions that the real revival had. Notice. They shouted. They screamed. They danced. They really got something out of that anointing. Sure it is. All like a real revival. But you notice, God was not in it. God was not in it. He had a prophet sitting right there in the land that they ought to have known. David should have known it. Something today, we got all the mechanics like the great denomination. Crusades of our time, but the results turning out the same as it was then. Our results of our great crusades and all of our big fineries and our big buildings and our big building thousands and adding members and things, it turns out the same way. All a flock. I'm not saying that to be different. I'm saying that to be honest before God, whose book I'm standing by this morning. All turns out a flock. Same result. Now, let us see what happens when God in his time and age and his prophets are not considered. Just depend on theology, priests, denominationalism, like we do today. Uh, close. It all gets messed up. 
If the true Spirit of God there, it'll direct it into the Word. Not just one place in the Word, the entire Word for the entire age. Amen. See? The day of Pentecost, the Spirit directed it right into that, Joel 2.38. The day of Luther, it directed right into that. Wesley, in this last Pentecostal move, but this is another age. This is the calling out of the bride. Not 2,000 years ago of Pentecost or the receipt of the return. Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was in Luther. The Holy Spirit was in Wesley. It's God's Word being anointed. And the Holy Spirit returned to the people of the age, and they began to have the restoration of the gifts. They found out, the yielding themselves to God, the Holy Ghost spoke in tongues through them. They laid their hands on the sick, and they were recovered. They danced in the Spirit. See, that was the age of the Reformation bringing the church back into order. And the last order of the church was placing the gift into the church. Like Luther, placed justification. Wesley, placed sanctification. Pentecost, placed the gift. But what did they do? The same mistake as nature has patterned through the wheat stalks. They denominate it, which is against God, contrary to God. Now, we find out that when then when these stuff others comes together, they form their own idea. No matter when the new issue is, they call it, come forth out of the assemblies of God. What did they do? They couldn't receive it. No matter how much truth it was, the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, they were already the general council. Man had done took it over. The Spirit had done left them. Huh? And then this come forth, I've talked to some of your best leaders. They say, well, what would we do now? They would embarrass themselves. When they know it's the truth. If they don't, they're spiritually blind and eager to the Bible. Not saying that nasty now. Saying that reverently. Because there's not a place in the Bible where anybody was ever baptized using those titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And never was used to let the ecumenical council, the Roman Catholic Church, their own catechism witnesses the same thing. It's a Catholic dogma. Amen. Not a Bible doctrine, but a Catholic dogma. New Methodists brought out your catechisms and everything is like they had, just gradually growing out of it. But now when you come to Pentecost and spread out some of those dogmas you still held on to, but now is the bride calling. Now it's when the seven seals has been opened. Now when the complete things that the reformers left has to be opened and only Malachi 4 can do that because it takes the revelation straight from God to an individual to do so. Amen. God? It can't come to a group. Never did. One man. That's why God promised in the shadows of the coming for his bride. An Eliezer. Notice. When priests, ministers, and so forth get their own inspiration and truly anointed, David was anointed. The Bible said so. But you see, he went to the wrong resource. He went to the wrong channel. He channeled his anointing on the wrong side to the people in what they thought, to the captain what they thought, instead of to God's holy channel to find out what thus saith the Lord was. Is this the time for this? Is this the season for this? Is this the will of God? Then if he's a true prophet of God, he'll go before God first. Say, Father, what is it? Like Nathan did later on to David. David said, is it right for me to live in a house of cedar in the ark of my God under tents out here? And look at Nathaniel. said, David, do all that's in your heart. For God is with you. You are anointed vessel of God. But that being a prophet and his mistake and God's duty bound to his prophet. That night he appeared to him and said, go tell my servant David. I admire his courage. I love him for this because he's a man after my own heart. And I know it's time that my heart would be that way, put under something, but I just, it ain't the season for it to happen. I'll let his son do it, but I won't let him do it. Then here come Nathan with dust. Say the Lord, David. The great revelation you had is as long as it was when you brought the ark up. Don't you do it. Don't try it. But God said he had your son to do it. 
There you are. David was anointed to say that because beforehand he could sit just as Abraham sought for a city on the earth. You're always looking for it because he's going to live here someday. Abraham is in that city. And he went around looking for it. And right on the same grounds where he looked, he was just above him then. And we'll return in the millennium. And he'll live in that city. But being a prophet, he was ordained and inspired. He knew there was a city somewhere. And he was looking for it. But you see, the whole revelation that was hid from him, it wasn't for his age. Went down to John, where he started coming down from God out of heaven. That was the city. See, everything has to be in its season. You plant your wheat in the spring or in the fall and cut it the next summer. It's got to come up through the stalk, got to come up through the tussle and shut on into the... It's got to be in season. All nature runs in continuity. The Spirit of God made nature. And all of God and nature is in continuity. All the things that put in the temple was a pattern of what he saw in heaven. You see a tree struggling, trying to live. That means there's a tree that don't die. You see a man struggling for life that shows that there is a tabernacle waiting somewhere that don't die. If this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already waiting. The good Heavenly Father permitted me to walk behind that curtain one day and see it. How many heard this? Oh, what's under? Look in the past curtain of time. There it was, just the same as I'm preaching to you all. There they stood. Souls under the altar crying. How long? Not just a myth. Somebody who had intelligence. How long was why we feel that now as our age, like Brother Bill Dow sitting here at 93, there's something longing for that young man again. There's something we get anything. How would like to, Brother Jack and all the rest of us, go back, Brother Hitholder here, and to that young manhood. What do we want to do it for? To be young and run around again? No, sir. Because we feel we'd have more time to glorify this God that we love. But my dear brother and I have this message this morning. There is a land beyond the river that they call it sweet forever. There we are glorifying through the ages and all the ages of eternity. Why do we feel that? Because the deep is calling to the deep. Yeah. And as long as the deep is calling, there's got to be a deep to respond to that call. There would be no call. Before there can be a creation, there has to be a creator first to create the creation. Or there's no. That shows the very evidence that there is. Notice these priests all out of line. Notice the anointing. All right. Nothing wrong with anointing. Same with you, Pentecostal. But watch what channel you're moving in now. The day has changed since Pentecost. Something else is going. If there had been no prophet in the land, perhaps David would have been right. Right. But there stood Nathan, vindicated, ordained, witnessed by God to be a prophet. Watch. The ark in the Bible always is a type of the word to us because it was the word of God in the ark. And was, notice the ark that they brought up. Look how they did it. It was not put in its original God-ordained position. Now, God said, back here in the laws, that it must, how it must be done, how this ark must be moved and who it must be moved by. But David, under his anointing, my brother, don't you miss this and my sister's? You who want to be women preachers and so forth? Don't you miss this? No matter how much your anointing is, you've got to get in God's provided position. David's anointing was all right. But in doing it, he got enthused and stepped over the boundary line. What did he do? He stepped over the boundary line instead of putting the ark in its original position he carried it on a new cart and not over the hearts of the Levites. It was supposed to be carried on the shoulder of the Levites, which is over the heart. The word is not in the mind, it's in the heart. Not on a new cart. What was that? Some represented something new. David did there, spoke of every denomination that ever be. God's word is not to be but carried by state presidents or bishops and so forth of denominations. It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the heart of man and not in some ecclesiastical mood. Amen. The Holy Spirit is a treasure of God's love in the heart of men and women to obey. See? It's on the shoulders 
of his ministers. His ministers was the Levites. Put it up over their left shoulder and packed that ark like that because it was up over their heart. They had the burden of the word on their heart. Hey, Amen. Now you got the burden of your denomination on your heart. The burden of your congregation, whether you go to build this or do that or do something else. The burden of how many more you go to give to your denomination. Instead of the burden of the word of the Lord, that that people will see only the word of God and nothing else. But you got on a new cart now, see. They're packing up your in ecumenical council even. Shoulders. I don't want to get critical. May God help me. I just tell it the truth. Now, influenced by creeds and ecumenical councils, the word, the real word of the season of that age was ignored because they had a lot of emotions. The David, the anointed king, he was king, but he was anointed king. You say, I'm a minister anointed, then stay a minister. Don't try to be a prophet. If you're evangelist, stay evangelist. Remember, as Uzziah, in the days of Isaiah, the young king, the young prophet, Uzziah was a great man, anointed man. God bless him. Bless you, Sabbath. I'll preach on that to you here one time. And one day he got so highly up that he thought he could just uh, take the office of a priest. And he took the uh, fire and went in before the Lord and the and priest told him, Don't do that, Uzziah. But he got exalted. The prophet couldn't tell him nothing. The priest knows their order. They're keeping their order. He said, that's not your order, you I Don't do that. Well, he made him shut up. And he went with the, with the fire in the offer. Take a priest's job. He was anointed king, not a priest. And those priests were trying to tell him, you're a wonderful king. You're anointed. God has blessed his body, but you're a king, not a priest. You pastors should never tell a prophet what to do. Hallelujah. Or you evangelists tell a pastor. Each one has his office if it is perfectly identified. So he went in with the farmer, stricken down with leprosy and died. Now here's David King. David's trying to do the same thing here. He's taking it up on himself. Well, that's fine. Got to go look around the people. What do you say, Captain? You have 10,000. Glory to God, David. I feel the Spirit. Oh, he is. He did feel it. What do you think, David? You feel it? Glory to God, it's all over me. Let's check it and see if it's right. Let's see. Where's the ark belong? With us. Belongs among us. Who should we consult? Sure, the ark. It's the same thing as that ground belonged to the Israel instead of the Philistines. Right. They belong to it. And as I feel the anointing too. The captains of hundreds, all the congregation, glory to God, they clapped and they shouted and they danced and jumped up and down. They had the Spirit. Amen. What do you think Father was thinking? How about sent Nathan, that prophet down there? They know what to do and so does David. But now he's just all enthused and stepped out over his boundary line. He went to do this. All right. Notice. Carried on the shoulders was God's original plan. There is five must. I want you to put these down. If you, I see you're right. And it's 20 something minutes after 10, so I'll try to be through by 11 if possible. I hurry as quick as I can. No matter how sincere a man may be in doing God a service, no matter how sincere, how much anointed, how much of a Presbyterian, Baptist, Pentecostal, no matter whether you are a bishop, deacon, whatever you are, pastor, evangelist, prophet, whatever it might be, there's five musts that must be considered first. No matter how much anointing, how good it seems, how the people shouting, everything the spirits are doing, there is a must. Now, my brother in law, you're getting your paper ready. Can you understand now why? Now remember, you've all thought and have been taught among you, not, see I'm speaking across the nation. 
that I did not believe in speaking in tongues. I do believe in speaking in tongues. Amen. But you can still speak in tongues and not have the Holy Ghost. Amen. First Corinthians 13 says, Though I speak with tongue of man and angel, I ain't nothing yet. See? That's the anointing of the Holy Ghost. That has nothing to do with the soul inside you. You can speak in tongues and deny the word. I see it done, you see it too. A woman can preach the gospel and speak. They can do all to cut their hair and still shout and speak in tongues and everything else. Amen. Exactly right. You've got to line up with the truth of the word. No, no matter how sincere a man may be, no matter how great he's used of God, no matter what he is, he must be this. Must be the thing that he's speaking of must be timely by the Bible. Somebody said, well, Moses back there. I know what Moses did. But that's not what God's doing today. Well, back down there 30 years ago, Luther said, that might be fine, but that's not what he's doing today. What, uh, 40 years ago, Pentecost fell, but that's not what he's doing today. It must be timely. It must be according to the Scripture. It must be in season, secondly. Thirdly, and it must be according to the way that God's Word spoke it would be. I say, glory to God, the Holy Ghost fell on me, hallelujah, just like it did on the day of Pentecost. That might be different today. It fell on David too, didn't it? Sure it did. It fell on his eye. But it was wrong. See, you got to go deeper than that. Man. you got to go deeper than that. Now, don't feel hurt, just, just be reverent. And notice, and it also must come to the man of God's choosing. Not a denominational choosing, not a people choosing, but according to God's choosing. And if it's a message from God, of a great revelation from God, it must come to His prophet. Amen. Now, if you want the scripture of that, it's Amos 3, 7. Okay. Now, it must, there's five things it must be. It must be in season. It must be at the time God said it would be. It must be written in the Word of God. It must be in the season of God's time. See? And it must be by God's choosing. And God doesn't need any of us to interpret His Word. God is His own interpreter. He don't need our seminary. He don't need our wisdom. It's nonsense. See? Eve got that. And missed the interpretation by her wisdom. Say, oh boy, that guy's a smart man. Well, that don't mean a thing. Sure. Ab was a smart man. Belteshazzar was a smart man. Satan was more cunning and crude. Subtle. None of it could withstand him. Not at all. I don't depend on no, no wisdom. Just depend on God. How is God? He is the Word. And then how does God interpret His own Word? Listen close now. Don't miss these things. How does God interpret His own Word? By making it come to pass. Not just one here, but all of it for that season. Not say, no, go out and preach the inspired, but build an ark. Put doors in it. Fix it this way and that way. What if you put the door on top instead of the bottom? What if you put the window on the bottom and the door on top? See? It's got to be instructed according to the time because that's exactly what God's going to use it for. It must be that way. And it must come by inspiration. I heard a guy say one time, said, I believe that man prays for the sick, I believe it's fine. But as being a prophet, said, I believe he's God's prophet. But as a teacher, why well, he's a Jesus only. What a, what kind of a person would you call that? A man doesn't know what he's talking about. The very word prophet means that he is a revealer of the word of God. The interpretation only comes to that. And that's why today we are in such a need of this great person that's supposed to be sent to us in the form of the prophet Elijah because it will be the revelation of God made known to us by vindication. Showing that it's the day and the hour and the season that God promised it to be in. And remember, he'll be spoken against. Always has been. 
Always will be. Reject it just like the shuck will pull. First, you'll be accepted because the shuck only holds the wheat until it's able to get forth to the sun. Pentecost will only shelter the message, give it an open door until it gets scattered. And then the shuck will pull away and the wheat will lay in the presence of the sun. Okay? For right. There won't be any denomination. You just remember, Brother Jack here is a historian. Many of you here are. There's never been a revival, but about three years after the revival, they started a denomination on it. Is that right? And this last great miracle move of God in this last days, it's went 20 years and it's a million miles from a denomination. Going further away all the time. The shucks pull it away. No cooperation, no nothing with it. See? Always it pulls away from it. They can't be no more. It's the wheat now. But we're plenty green. Right. But to lay in the presence of the sun to be mellowed up. That's all of it. Plenty green. We haven't got the sincerity, the sacredness, the thing we ought to have in our midst to know that the Spirit of the living God moving in His Word and showing us the things yet. We have false impersonators rise up. What's that to do to deceive? The Bible said they would. As Jambres and Jambres withstood Moses, so will these in the last days. Do the same. They come right along impersonating it just as that. Be careful. What's the doctrine of the Bible? What's the message that follows them signs? Still the same old school message? Forget it. God sent the miracles and signs to attract the attention of his people. When Jesus comes, this healing is sick and so forth, so did the prophets. They thought, oh, glory, he's coming. He's going to be a Pharisee. He's going to be a Sadducee. But he said, you generation of serpents and vipers. He said, you're your father, the devil. His word should do. He said, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, there's no life in you. He didn't explain it. He didn't have to explain it. Hallelujah. That was for another season. He just said what he had to say. I always do that what is pleasing to the Father, and that's keeping his word. If I don't, my life and my works don't compare with his word I'm supposed to do, then don't believe me. I'm not him. But if it does, then believe the works. If you can't believe me, he said. Notice now, these must, it must be done. Now, see, God had not revealed a thing to them by his provided way. He had revealed it by inspiration, but it was in the wrong channel. The inspiration will go fine, but if it's in the wrong channel, it'll be channel wrong. Like you take a bullet and shoot it directly to a target. It's making its way right to the target, but a puff of wind can blow it out. Now, on your automobile, you go down the road 60, 70 miles an hour, and a puff of wind blows you, you can straighten your wheels back up, throw it back in the road again, but you can't a bullet. It doesn't have to straighten its wheels up. It misses the target. See? It must travel in its original channel. So must the Word of God travel in its original channel. No little puff of wind is going to blow it off. No little denomination is going to blow it off. No little persecution is going to blow it off. Amen. It's directed to the point. It's going to hit there too. And then God, when it hits that point, God will vindicate it. Hold on. Exactly what he said. If you hear it in the scripture, this thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass. Here it is. There you are. Now, God did not reveal it in his provided way. So they went about to do it Apart from his word and apart from the season, just the same as they have now. When man, no matter how sincere, tried to do him a service outside of his provided way, they always mess it up. Like Balaam. Balaam thought he was doing God a service. Do you think God lies? Does God ever change his mind? Well, people act today like he did. When he said for women not to cut their hair, they said we can cut. Doctor so and so said we could. Brother so and so said you're just too near minded. Well, can this happen? This ha yeah, yeah. So and so said so. God don't change his mind. Do you believe Balaam was a prophet? The Bible said he was. You believe he was a prophet? Now remember, Balak come to him and said, "Go down and curse this people." Father, they're all over the face of the earth. They're not even a denomination. Not a nation. <laughs> they're just a scattered bunch. And we are the dignitaries of the land. Now you go down there and curse that people and I'll pay you for it. And Balaam done exactly what a prophet should do. He said, I'll not go. You just wait your order night. Let me see what God says do. So he went in. He said, Lord, there's some people out here with me. They come when we go down and curse another people down there. He said, what do you want me to do about it? 
God said, don't you go. For them's my people. They went out and said, go on back to your house. I can't go with you. God told me not to do it. Now, there's God's original word. Don't go. Well, then they went back and said, you know, your bishop wouldn't listen. Well, the king said, tell you what we do. He needs a little money. I believe that could persuade him. Or maybe I'll uh, make him state president. Maybe I'll give him some great something to do. I might make him the bishop. You can't tell. What I might do. You, I'll tell you what I do. You fellow think I got enough education to persuade him anyhow. Your hands and hanks and totes and bets and carry ain't it right? He wouldn't listen to you. We'll send a real educated bunch down. More dignitary. He went down there and said, Dr. Balaam. Dr. Balaam. Greetings to you. I'll bring you salutations from the king. Morning, brethren. Now, Dr. Balaam. And all the vocabulary. How it was really poured on. And said, now the king has said that he will exalt you. And he will also give you great honor. And you know, they only offered you so much money to take this charge. But the king says he'll triple it. Quadruple it. If you'll just come and take it. And Balaam got its in hand. He got foolish ideas and he stirred his mind. Now remember, he called God by it, anointed. But he stirred God right away from the original plan. And that's exactly what Pentecost is done. To be popular, you oneness, you trinity. For popularity, you denominated to be different. You organized and you're dead. Amen. You'll never rise again. Amen. But you see, you ought to stay with God. He pulled you out of that assembly to make you a people, but you organized and went right back into the same puke you come, excuse me, out of the same stuff you come out of. As a dog goes to its vomit in a... Oh, just, well, I'm sorry I said that. Forgive me. That's not right for the platform here. See? I just said that in the flesh. Notice. Now, the, uh, that's what I mean to vomit. I should said it like that. The word was all right, but just misused. It was used all right, but just a mis sound. You know, vomit. As a dog returns to its vomit. If the assemblies of God, the general council, organized Pentecost at the first place and got them into that so they could not accept the revelation, don't you know oneness you've done the same thing? How could you receive the message of serpent seed, eternal security, and these other things that's come for us? You're so tightly organized, so you won't even let it in your door. Same thing Balaam did, but God didn't change his mind. So Balaam went over and said, Lord, now look, I really got an opportunity now to be somebody. You know, I've been a nobody, but I got an opportunity to be somebody. What do you say about it now, Lord? I should never said that. He knows exactly what God said to you. So to every one of his baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. All these other issues of the Bible is supposed to be in this day. You know what to do about it is accept it when you see God plainly vindicated the truth. That's God interpreting his own words. But will you do it? No, your organization won't let you do it. Many of the ministers there in Tucson listening in this morning. Brother Gilmore, I have nothing against you. Brother Brock, First Assembly, and Friendly Church, you man, I was there all that time. You wouldn't even let me come in. I'm sure you couldn't. You can't. And remain what you are. You can't accept revelation. Because you're denominated. And listen, just as you and I was killed... Because it's under that false inspiration, so is many true Christians losing their experience back in those old dead denominations because they're putting their hand on the ark when they're not ordained to do so. Now, you can believe it or not believe it. That's up to you. God's your judge. God never did take back his word. What he said the first time, he says for every time. He told Balaam, don't you go. And then Balaam come back and said, but Lord, could I go? Now look, God said, go on. Now he's giving permission to go. 
There is a permissive will of God and not the original will of God. You see what a trouble he got into? And any man that builds anything, any organization or anything outside of upon the Word of God is shaking sands and will fall. It'll die as sure as anything. Because the Word of God is a growing body of the bride. You can't have it all foot, all arm, all thighs. These things come in their seasons. At Pentecost, you made it all one thing. Therefore, you can't accept new revelation. That's the reason you stay right where you are and die. Moves on. So much. Don't want to wear you out. But God doesn't change his mind. His first decision is exactly right. So God doesn't change his mind. He just lets you go on on your permissive will. God's a good God, as old Robert says. He's also a fearful God. Look, it's like you say, glory to God, I want to speak with tongues. He'll let you do it. And that old son, you got the Holy Ghost. And remember what Thomas said, the old doubter? Unless I have some evidence, I've got to stick my fingers and nails and hands and in the side, I, I, I won't even believe it. Now, there you are, the same thing. Jesus said, here you are, Thomas. Stick your hands in here, then, if that's what you want to know. Now, if you want the Thomas right, go ahead. But what did he say? How much greater is your reward who has never seen and yet believed? Notice, notice, by doing this, he caused the death of sincere man putting his hand on the ark when he shouldn't have done it. A great sincere man thanked the anointing and everything was just right. But the ark was moving in his wrong ways. The oxen, the Bible said, stumbled. Not the Levites. The oxen stumbled. And the cart was being pitched over in a sincere man with his heart full of love. Put his hand up on the ark to hold it back and was stricken dead. Because no man could touch that ark but a Levite. See how God keeps his word, keeps his channel, keeps his order. Uzziah was smitten with leprosy. There's David altogether caused the death of a man in a great disaster, being anointed with the Spirit, both of them, but out of God's channel. Is that right? He died. Oh, it scared David to death. He called the, the name of the place that Brother Jack read. It. See? He marked him there. How many times denominations have done the same thing to sincere believers? The Catholic Church, the Methodists, the Baptists, Church of Christ, even the Pentecostals, has caused a many spiritual death of that same thing. When they come with these things they found and they can't go no further because that's what their denomination believes. Look today, the big crusades, same thing. They don't do nothing to make them more twofold child of hell worse than it was in the first place. Makes them harder to really come to the crusades. Have one of these big revivals, all of them come in, carry on a little while, go back out and start on the sin again. Hear another revival and say, Ah, oh, I had some of that stuff I tried. It's nothing good. They don't know the channel. I heard our great evangelist Billy Graham sat one morning at a breakfast like this, and he said, I, Here, he fucked up the Bible in Louisville, Kentucky. He said, There is God's example. And that's true. The man said the truth. He said, You go, Paul went into a city and had one convert, come back a year from there, had 30 out of that convert. Say, but I go into a city and have 30,000 converts and come back in six months and can't find 30. He said, you know what's the matter? He said, you lazy preachers. He said, you sit around your foot up on the desk and, and call these people by phone instead of visiting them after supper and talking to them. Oh, my heart was burning. I thought, oh, great man of God. I hate to disagree with you here. But who was the lazy preachers on Paul's one convert? What he done, he took him into the word, he took him into the message, he took him to where he found God. His heart was on fire, he set the country afire. And the only thing you do is put him in a Baptist or Methodist church or something. No one is nothing to burn. Yes, sir. Then look what the word has promised for today. Let's find out whether it's Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostals, or what for today. Now you can go to read your scriptures. <laughs> Take these scriptures that are being quoted to you. Also, Revelations. If I had time, I'd read it, but I just haven't. I've got about 12, 14 more minutes. I've got to close on time at 11 if I get out right. Notice, Malachi 4, Revelation 10, 7 seals. Didn't the Bible say? Now watch. There was an angel, a messenger from above, and an earthly messenger. And each messenger was for the age of the church. He said, in the day speaking now, there came an angel, messenger, word angel, English word means messenger, came down from heaven. And he put his foot 
on the land and sea and swore by him that lives forever and time shall be no more. Is that right? A rainbow around his head and all these things just taking place. That angel was Christ. Certainly. But what did he say? But in the days of the seventh angel, the seventh church age, always it's right at the end of the church age where they got the thing so the ecclesiastics so messed up until God sends a messenger. And that's the message of that church age. Then they take his message because he used to live a little while. And God, then they take his message and still are carrying on with the rest of it. They make a, a denomination. And then they come, make another denomination. Another messenger, take another one. You all seen in my book. It'll all be drawn out in the seven church ages. Which he told me. Which I stand by as a witness to God to be judged as the day of judgment for. It come from God, not from my thinking. Notice. Here, I thought, I thought different from that. I'm about to go to have my own thought, like Brother Jack told me about the angel there. How did that Christ was a glorified body. But it wasn't as showing the message being right. The supreme deity, he was God. Just the very thing he had been preaching from the Word. The Word always bears record of the Word. Now, quickly now, as we are fixing to close in a few moments. Now, he said, in the days of the message of the seventh angel, the earthly angel, seventh church age, then all these mysteries that's been lost back to these other six church ages should be revealed right then. Well, that's exactly what those angels said. There is the seven seals or the opening of these mysteries. You try to get it before those denominations. Contrary to what they... Brother, they close up like a clam. But they've always done it. But it's season. How many knows that this is the seventh church age? Say amen. amen. The lady of sin Amen. A lukewarm. Amen. That God spews out of his mouth. Amen. And they spew God out of their mouth. Amen. There's not another age in the Bible where Jesus is found on the outside trying to not get back in. They cut him out. No cooperation. Who is Jesus? The Word. Amen. The Word was put out. The husk thrown out the wheat. But I stand at the door and knock. And any man in them shackles out there would hear my voice. Oh, God, have mercy. It was at then, when that man died, that David, with the anointing, saw what he had done wrong. Oh, David, you pastor. <laughs> Can't you see your dead creeds and denominations you're holding on to? Can't you see what it's doing? It's killing the youth's eye. Spiritually dead, and you're wondering where there ain't no revival. Let your women cut their hair, paint their face, wear a shirt. Send your boys away to Ricky schools and so forth like that, where half of them comes home homosexual. You know? Notice, David's objective. He was bringing the ark to his own house. That wasn't the capital. That was the place. It belonged in Jerusalem. But David was bringing it to his own house. He wanted the revival to be on his own denomination. Oh, if you're simply all right. If you're oneness, all right. If you're Pentecostal, okay. Like somebody said, said, Brother Graham, how do you ever have anybody listen to you? So I can see Billy Graham. He's got every denomination of country with him. I can see Oral Roberts, every Pentecostal, hangs right to him. But said, you're against the whole thing. Said, how in the world do you ever get anybody? I said, it's God. I, the Lord, have planted it before the foundation of the world. I'll water it day and night. Unless some of them should pluck it from my hand, Isaiah. I, water, I planted it. I put their names on the book before the foundation of the world by predestination. I'll water it. Just keep on moving. I'll furnish the water. You just spray it out. <laughs> right. Okay. I'll water it day and night unless one of them gets plucked out of my hand. There you are. Wanted to come to the city of David instead of Jerusalem. There was no place ready for it at that time, and so is it today. These great mysteries that's been unfolded to these seven seals is not a place in any denomination that has to quit being a denomination to take it. All the way from Luther on down to the Pentecostal ones. There's not a place can receive it. Neither can a man receive it and stay in his denomination. He'll have to follow the wheat or go with the shuck, either one he wants to. Christ is our ark, the Word. They want their denomination. He cannot, notice, cannot be carried 
on the new carts of the denomination. His message cannot go on the cart of a new denomination when it's supposed to be bore and come on the heart of a prophet. It cannot. He promised that it would be thus, and that's the way it must be, so the denomination will never receive it, neither can they receive it. And they're just as blinded to it as the Jews was when they hung Jesus to the cross. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Don't despise them, but just think. What if you was in that same condition with your eyes so blind that you can't wake up and see what's going on? Neither could they see that that was their very God. When he was hanging there on the cross and then singing the 22nd Psalm in the temple a few hundred yards away. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They pierced my feet and my hands. See? All my bones, they stare at me. Why hast thou forsaken me? And there the very God that they had sung about, blind enough to have him packed to the cross. And didn't know it. Now, don't the Bible say it's a lady of seeing church that thinks that she's so great by her denominational members? She'd be naked, miserable. Poor, blind, and don't know it. What does the blind mean? The blind means for this lady to see a church like it did the ending of the Jewish church. Blind to the very Christ that they had on the outside, knocking, trying to get in. Naked, miserable, poor, wretched, blind, and don't know it. Oh, God of mercy. Why can't the wheat lay out in the presence of that sun yard and see the hour we're living in? Yes. Christ is our art. But his original way to do it. Then, here he is. They had his spirit, all right. We know that. They wait upon the Lord, see his plan on his original word, in its season, to be vindicated. That's what we should be doing right now. And he, re he reveals their faith by his word, seeing him confirm every plan that he promised, not man's schemes of denomination, not making members for our own ark. They've got a Methodist ark, a Baptist ark, a Presbyterian ark. Everybody's going into this ark for the great tribulation coming. <laughs> Glory to God, I was baptized in the Methodist ark, the Presbyterian, the Pentecostal ark. There's only one ark. That's Jesus Christ. And he is the word. Amen. Notice God told the prophet, said, eat the scroll. Amen. In the Old Testament, the prophet of the New Testament said, eat the little book. Why? That the prophet and the word would be one. Amen. That's the ark. The word of God. God has promised his word how it would be fulfilled. And how it would come to pass when he chose his bride. How it would be done. It's happening right before you, in the name of the Lord. And that's by the original word. The evening time message is here. How many remembers Haywood? When he wrote, it shall be light about the evening time. The path of glory you'll surely find. Yes, the evening promise of the seven seals of Revelation 10, Malachi 4. Luke 30 and 10. Read Deuteronomy 4, 4, 1 and 4. Then 25th and 26th verse and see what he said about for this last day. This was Moses saying to Israel to keep every word. Don't you add one thing. Moses, that prophet, had been up there and seen that word of God and it was rolled out to him and vindicated by God's own handwriting. He said, you keep every word. Don't you add one thing to it or take one thing from it. You read that in the 25th and 26th verse of Deuteronomy 4. Notice. Don't you add to it. Don't you take away from it. Because if you do, God will take your part from the book of life and it shows that you wasn't his seed. Remember, everything that God has promised us, everything that God spoke to us, everything that's been told to you in the name of the Lord, it has happened. God has never made one promise, no, but he's kept every promise that he said and has told us has been the truth. For these 20 years, report. I preach to you through the power of God and the courtesy of your pastors. And I take you to record today even to women past bearings, man, children, afflictions, healings, 
prophecies, things that would happen. Not one of them has ever failed. Now stay away from those denominations. They're leading you to death. Samuel stood one day and they said, we want a king. We want to be like the rest of the world. Then Samuel said, don't take that king. You'll take your sons and daughters and you'll do this and do that. He said, yeah, I know you're right. Samuel said, listen to me. Did I ever take any of your money? Did I ever beg you for a living? Did I ever tell you you had to give me so much salary to hold a meeting for you? Now judge yourself, even now. He said, did I ever tell you anything in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? Not one thing. Oh, yes, Samuel. You never did beg us for money. You never did want big things. Samuel, that's true. And everything you told us in the name of the Lord come to pass. But Samuel, we want our denomination anyhow. Then go take it. It's up to you. Right. You can think you're doing God a service. If you're going out of God's way of doing it, you're going to keep messing it up on and on. Oh, church of the living God. Please forgive my Irish way and my sense of humor. But in the sincerity and sacredness of my heart, you assemblies of God, you one Presbyterian, Methodist, whatever you are, flee for your life. Remember, get out from there. Nations are breaking. Israel's awakening. Get ready for that remnant. The signs that the prophets foretold. The denominational days are numbered with horrors and cumbered. Return or disperse to your own. A day of redemption is near. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Be filled with his spirit. Have your lamps trimmed and clear. Look up. Your redemption is near. You believe that? We're at the end of it. We're here. The handwriting's on the wall. The second coming is at hand. The bride is being chosen, watered, drawn out. Now, that don't mean drawn out from church. That means drawn out from denominationalism. You must go to church. But don't join any organization. Jesus went with all the organizations, but he never joined to one of them. Neither did he side with any of them. No, indeed, but he's among them. There's where the light got to be scattered, and you stay right where you are scattering the light. That's what God's using you for. The hungry-hearted people. Let them know that Jesus Christ is real, just the same as he was yesterday, he is today, and will be forever. It is possible that a man or woman with all sincerity, trying their best to do God a service, is stirred it in the wrong way. With a genuine anointing of the Holy Spirit upon them, but stirred it contrary to God's plan for the age, and chaos the whole thing. Now, if you believe that's the truth, say amen. amen. We've just read it. Chaos the whole thing, but not coming. God provided ways to do it. Let us pray. O oh, church, here and across the nation, listen to your humble servant this morning, will you? Look where you were at a few years ago when this first started. Now look what impersonations have capitalized on it. Great millions and billions of dollars has flowed into the organization. See? Still away from the Word of God. Buildings and organizations is not the way God stirs His Spirit. He stirs it right into His Word to make it live. And if you are ordained from the beginning of the earth to that word, every word will come right on top of the word. Like a human cell will not have one human cell and the next the cell of a dog and the next the cell of a cat. It'll be human cells. But it's got to have a cell first to start with. Is that right? Say amen. Well, if it is the word cell to start with, the other word cells are ordained to make it a full body. Don't be children only in love, but be man in spirit and in judgment. Judge ye 
whether I've told you the truth or not. Judge ye whether it's the word of God or not. Judge ye whether it's the hour we're talking about or not. Judge ye whether these things are permanent. Now, are they vindicated? By things that there's not a human being in the world could do it. But it's become so common to us so we're letting it flow right on the passage. Wait, church, wait. There's one in here this morning that doesn't know Jesus Christ. Doesn't stand justified this morning. Your sin's all gone as though you never had sin. And you want to be that way. Because remember, one day, maybe today, maybe in the next five minutes, but one day that heart's going to stop. And that inside of the inside is going to take its flight to stand in the presence of God to be judged according to what you do with this message this morning. According to this message. That you see not, it ain't me, I'm just a mouthpiece. Like this microphone, it can't say a thing unless I'm talking in it. And neither could I say anything unless God was talking to it. But you see, God's vindicated to be the truth. You want to be a real Christian. Now, we have no place for an altar call, but right at the table where you're sitting, the place is packed and jammed, overflowed. I couldn't call you to an altar. There's no altar here to call you to. But the altar is in your heart. Won't you let that little conviction that Jesus Christ is real move right up close today and call the rest of his body to you? Manger him in your heart. If he isn't there, would you raise your hand in a sign to him saying, Lord, fill me. Fill me with your word and with your presence that I might live by you. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, all across the nation, raise your hands here in the visible audience and out there too. And I'll offer prayer for you. It's all I can do. I cannot fill it. God bless you. I cannot fill it. God bless you. God can fill it. God bless you. Hands going up here in the visible audience. Everyone. Fill it. Fill me, O oh Lord. Fill me. And now, after I thank you, sister. Thank you, brother. God bless you. After I, God bless you, sister. You. After I think now, I've caught the most of the sincere, the trying to be. I want to raise my hands with you. O oh Lord, never let me come to a standstill. Continually, Lord. Let me not stop at one thing. Let me just move on, Lord, till I have completed everything that you ordained for me to do. Regardless of the price, regardless of the cost, regardless of the criticism, how high the cross is, I remember the cross that you bore. So this consecrated cross I'll bear until death shall set me free. Then go home a crown to wear. There's a crown for me. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free? No, there's a cross for every one of these sons. That's a cross for me. Dear God, the word has gone forth. It cannot return void. It'll find its place somewhere. If the seed has already been planted, it'll water it so it grows and none can pluck it from your hand. All the Father has given me will come to me. No man can pluck them out of my hand. My Father has given them me before the foundation of the world, when the plans were all drawn up as so. Jesus was given his church, his bride. The bogus marriage of the world to these denominations. You came and died into the world. You redeemed her. You justified her. She never did it at the first place. She was trapped into it blindly. And as the song says, I once was lost and now I'm found. I was once in Lady of Sea blind, but now I see. And it's grace that taught my heart to fear. It was grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. And the water of God fell upon my soul. I was parching. God, at this little altar of every heart present here and around the nation, May the waters from under the altar of God gush out this morning upon your church. Water it, Lord, for the season is just about finished. Give it life, the waters of life. That it might be able to lay in the presence of the sun to be ripened for your great garner. 
Father, I pray for them. But the stalk must die. So I cannot pray for it. It must die. So it is dead. But I pray for the wheat, Lord, that's forming into the body of Christ. Grant, Lord, that the fresh waters of God will keep its cheeks bathed with tears of joy and understanding until the combine comes to take it home. In Jesus' name, I commit it all to you, Lord. The result is yours. Amen. Amen. So, Father God, we thank you. And, Father, we pray for our little sister, handmaid here, for her strength. I'm thinking of a time that when I walked in the presence of her, how that the Spirit came upon her and gave the same message that the angel of the Lord gave on the river that day as John the Baptist was sent to forerun the first coming of the Lord Jesus, your sense of forerun the second. Seeing it shaping up now into the weak part. God, we thank you for everything you've done. Our hearts are filled beyond speaking. I feel so full, Lord, I just don't know how to say anything else. But thank you, Father, again, for all that you have done for us. Through Jesus Christ's name. I love him. Let's just sing to him now. Remember, he's here. to do that, raise your hand. Now reach right across the table. Put your hands in one another's hands, like this. Together. You can be seated, that's all right, whatever you want. Listen closely. Let's sing it together now. This represents our unbroken chain of the love of God. We're holding one another's hands because we believe in God. We touch each other because we're brothers and sisters, the same vibrating spirit, the eternal word of God dwelling in our hearts, being made manifest. When our journey is completed, if to God we have been true, fair and bright are 
our home in glory. Our enraptured soul shall be oh, to God. Just get your mind on it. This is the kind of meanings we must set in in the future. It's unchanging. Build your hopes. Things eternal. The word's the only thing there is eternal. Look at it today, what it's done. To seek to gain the heavenly treasure, they will never pass away. Oh, to God. people, Father, bring sincerity and deepness to the hearts of the people. May we get off of those fragile bubble dances, settle down into the deep riches of the honey of God. Grant it, Lord. Keep our hearts established with love and sincerity. Bless thy people everywhere, Father. As we leave this place, may we go in the name of the Lord Jesus to speak that which is sincere, that which is truth, that which is right. May we shun that what's wrong, Lord. When a man begins to lie to us, may we quickly turn our back upon him. Turn our back to all dirty, filthy jokes and things of the world. And just turn our back and walk away. Help us, dear God, mold us Make us, break us, make us into the images of sons and daughters of God that we might act with the virtue of the Holy Spirit. We commit ourselves to you with our hands and each other in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Stand.
ಅದನ್ನೇ ಓದ್ತಾರೆ